Howdy. Howdy. Oh, there you go. That's good. So today, I'm going to talk about an aspect of engineering which you would think of as magic. And uh, to start with, Arthur C. Clarke, who was, a, who was one of the leading science fiction writers of the 20th century, said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right? This is actually uh, Clark's third law. Uh, the second, the first one says that if you see an, an elderly and senior professor tell you that something is possible, it probably is. If the professor tells you that something is not possible, it's probably wrong. So I'm going to tell you about things that are possible so that I'm probably right. <laughs> okay? So, <clears throat> you know, when you, when you, what I'm going to talk to you about is smart objects. Right? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, you got a smartphone, you got a tablet, you've heard all this stuff, and it's going to be another IT talk by an Indian guy. <laughs> no. As it is, I think already computers have taken over our world. It looks to me like I'm already working for my computer. It is my boss. Think about it, right? You go in, you log in, you report to your boss. It tells you what to do in the calendar. You go do it, and then you come back and report to it. If that's not the definition of boss, I don't know what is, right? So I'm not trying to, I, what I want is not a boss. I want a butler, <laughs> right? Somebody who I can tell them to do something and they will go and do it, right? So the thing that, that actually fascinated me, I mean, as, you know, so I, I saw that Babylon 5 was, did not ring a bell with you, and that's not surprising because it's a really obscure science fiction movie, right? So I'm, I've always been a science fiction buff, and what really interested me about science fiction was not the cool computer graphics and things like that, but the morphing things, you know? There's the Klingon bird of prey, it's going around like that, and then suddenly it becomes like a, like a vehicle. <laughs> Right? So I said, you know, that looks like magic. The question is, can we make ordinary objects that can do that kind of thing? Right? So imagine you're sitting in your chair, and you imagine what would, what would it be like if your chair were a smart chair? Right? So maybe you're feeling sleepy, and then it makes sure that your headrest is right, and you go to sleep, and you're comfortable. Or if you're in class, and you're feeling sleepy, it adjusts it so that it, you look awake to your instructor. <laughs> right? So that's what I want. Right? But of course, we cannot get all that we want. And as an instructor, since I know it, I always catch people who are pretending to be awake. Um, but before we plunge into this, I want you to ask yourself the following question. What does smart mean to you? Right? So what I did was I went and I actually looked at the dictionary. Look at what it says. Marked by often sharp, forceful activity or vigorous strength. Does that surprise you? You know, people usually think smart has to something to do with knowledge or intelligence or something, right? But notice smart actually means activity, active stuff. My wife always says I'm not particularly smart, but probably she knows the meaning of the word more than I do. But the point is, if you want to think about materials as being smart, according to this definition, you wouldn't call your, your smartphone smart, right? It does not have forceful activity, does it? Would you describe your smart, smartphone as having vigorous strength? Not really. So let me give you an example of what I mean. An intelligent phone, like the one that I have, rings and wakes me up in the morning, right? A smartphone is one which would slap my face if I didn't wake up. <laughs> right? That I can see as being vigorous activity. <laughs> see what I mean? Of course, I don't want my smartphone to slap my face. But you get the idea, right? So the question is, can we make these smart things? How do we make something that, if you look at a classical setup like a cell phone or your computer or something like that, what it does, it stores and manipulates information. 
right? But what I want to do with these kinds of things is to have action. So the first example, of course, is a very boring one. It's a car. And if you think about a car, it actually does what I was thinking about, right? I give it some command, it figures out what to do and then does it. It doesn't tell me, okay, you change the gear, like what your computer would do. Right? So how does, it, how does a car do this? You notice it has lots of parts, and the parts join together, it's like an orchestra, and it plays music, and the music is the action. Right? But this is not what I'm talking about. Can the material of the car itself, can, your, the, can the stuffing and the fabric of your chair, can it respond to you? This is a different level of smartness. So to give you an example, can this wire, I don't know if you can zoom in on this wire, maybe you can see it. Can you see it? Can this wire be smart? Right? So the question is, how do you make materials smart? So let's look at an example from the electronics industry. I don't know, maybe few of you who are above a certain age can recognize what that is. That's a triode valve, which used to be the heart of electronics when they started out. And you can see it's made up of parts, like your car, and they all join together and they manipulate electrons. From that, we went to a transistor. This has fewer parts, but it does the same job. From that, we went to IC, integrated circuit. This has no parts, you cannot dismantle it. Its functionality comes from the atomic arrangement of the parts in the, in the silicon chip. Can we do the same thing with materials? The answer, the big idea, is the following. Instead of storing information, what you want to store, recall, manipulate, is geometry, shapes. So yes, I am not the Indian guy talking about IT, I am the Indian guy talking about GT geometrical technology, right? So how do you make materials remember and transform between different shapes? To get you an idea of this, think about, let's say you want to play tennis or something like that, or cricket or, or soccer or something. You don't go sit in a class and they tell you at what angle the ball will come and how you're supposed to think about it and what is the velocity at which you should go. You don't use your conscious brain. What do you do? You have to practice. You have to train, right? And your muscles will completely bypass your conscious brain. You get what is called muscle memory. And not everybody of us can be very good at tennis or cricket or something like that. I, for example, am lousy at cricket and tennis and soccer, <laughs> right? Like that, materials also, only some of them can be made to remember shapes. So let me show you. So if you can zoom in on this a little bit. I don't know whether you can see this is this is an ordinary piece of wire. I bend it. I bent it into some shape. And no matter what I do, it'll, it, would have, it would have forgotten its original shape. It has no memory. You bend it a few times, it will break. Right? In fact, that's how we break all these things. You just cycle it a few times. On the other hand, this material, this piece of wire, I bend it. Right? I don't know whether you can see it. And then, I don't know whether you can see it straightening out. I bend it again. it will straighten out again. I can bend it again. <laughs> right? That. So for those of you who couldn't see that that well, I'll show you a different one, which is the same kind of material. So this one, OK, there it is. Can you see? Now that you could claim as having vigorous strength. Can you see that? It jumped around, it does all kinds of interesting things, right? Doesn't it look a little bit creepy to you? 
right? That's because we assign life to things that move by themselves. Okay, so it looks kinda alive, right? The, the challenge for us is to make it so that they can actually do be the, they can actually do useful things. This belongs to a class of materials which are called distributed molecular actuators. What it is is that it is distributed because every part of the wire actually works. It's molecular because it's not, it doesn't have parts, it's not electronics, it's nothing. It is at the atomic and molecular level and it's, a, it's an actuator because it changes shape. And there are several varieties, some of which, which we make in our lab. There is something called a shape memory alloy, which is a very common one. There is a shape memory polymer. There are ionic gels. There are all kinds of interesting materials that have this property. They can remember multiple shapes. So in order to do this successfully, you need two things. You need a signal. You need it to say, okay, now start changing, start shape shifting now. Then you need energy. Transformation requires energy, and you need energy. And if you have both the signal and energy, you will have morphing or shape shifting. The signal can be an electrical signal, mechanical signal, chemical signal, magnetic signal, any of these things. Same with energy. You can have chemical energy, you can have mechanical energy, and so on. So if you combine those two things, you can get objects that morph. Okay, so I'll show you another example. This is a more complicated one. Uh, you can see that it remembers the word love. Can you read it? Yeah, so what it is is that it's supposed to show that love is eternal. I go and destroy it, whoops. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go and destroy. There, that's my, that's my good friend uh, Shiva Kumar's hand and he has destroyed love right now and then true love reappears. <laughs> okay? In this particular case, the trigger is the temperature of the water that I dipped it in. So if I dip it in cold water, it will not start. If I dip it in hot water, it will change shape. The energy is from the thermal energy of the water. Okay, I'll show you another one. This is actually a, 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 a material that, has, that can have three different shapes and it can cycle between them depending upon the trigger. And this is actually an artificial jellyfish. And what it does, and this has been built, is that it uses the dissolved oxygen and hydrogen in the ocean to power itself. So it will slowly move around like a jellyfish and you can gather data in the ocean without having to supply power to it. It does it automatically. If you by chance happen to have um, a blocked artery and your doctor says you need to get a stent, which is a scaffolding for your artery, the chances are you will get what is called a smart stent. This is a this is out of the same material that I showed you. It gets into your artery in a crushed form so that it's very tiny. It goes into your artery. It's triggered by your body temperature and by your body heat and it will unfurl itself and take the shape of your artery. It will conform to the shape of your artery. And it will resist your artery from collapse. If your artery expands, it will expand with it, but if you try to collapse it, it will, it will not. This is a safety valve for an, oil, for an oil well. And this, actually, the trigger for this is electromagnetic waves. And it actually has a shape memory alloy which will open a valve if there is emergency. The last one is a very interesting one. I told you about morphing a Klingon bird of prey into a thing, right? We are not there yet. But we can do a morphing plane a little bit. This is a Boeing's morphing plane setup. So, you know, you know jet planes make a lot of noise, right? Right? They are really loud. And the reason why they are loud is the same way that some people can whistle well. You know what I mean? You pucker your teeth like that. Right? I'm not a good whistler, as you can see. But that's the sound that you hear from your jet airplane. In fact, that's the lip. Right? And the air flows out like that, and it makes a huge noise. So how do you control that? 
by changing the shape of your lip. So that's what these things are. These things are called re rear chevrons of the plane. And you can see that there are three things which are called SMA, that is shape memory alloy. And what it will do is, when the plane takes off, it will bend those, your lips closer so that it will not make any sound. So this is an example of what these kind of shape shifting materials can do. Now you remember I talked to you about coming back to your chair and things like that. The challenge is the following. You know, it brings me to the last item, which is that we are not only trying to make new objects, but we are also trying to make safe and economical objects. So if I make a chair that's, that's a smart chair, if it malfunctions, it's likely to kill you. <laughs> right? This doesn't happen with computer software. You know, if your cell phone mal malfunctions, yeah, your wife may kill you, but not you. <laughs> right? So, but my point is, the minute we get from bits into atoms, we have to worry about safety, and it takes about 30 years from the time we come up with the idea before it becomes commercial. So shape memory alloys were invented 30 years ago, maybe longer than that, right? So I want you to understand that this is what engineers do with new materials. We first come up with an idea, and then uh, we gradually figure out how to make it possible with safety in mind. I hope you'll join me in trying to build new materials out of this. Thank you.